this, this is not an easy talk to give. I usually tell people, uh, don't read my lips, read my paper. But when the, the invitation came here, I wasn't going to turn it down. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, I think in order to sort of make this fly in a relatively short period, I got to cut down what I'm interested in. I'm going to work, just work, focus on one thing. Uh, which has become hugely topical, which is the what might be called the dysfunctional U.S. Congress. And the sort of question uh, that I'm, I'm trying to answer uh, is what accounts for the fantastic increase in partisanship there in the last uh, 25 or 30 years, which uh, it just happens to be associated with policy paralysis. Um, the, I mean, the paralysis is pretty, I mean, now this is a real easy talk to give because of the debt ceiling and uh, debt issues uh, discussions in the last year. <laughs> That's all coming back at the end of the year. In fact, you will have your super uh, paralysis discussion at that point because of the way all these political compromises in the last couple of years were made to put together so that, for instance, your unemployment compensation bill, your ex the question of the tax cuts that were temporarily extended, all that stuff expires just after the presidential election, as though by an invisible hand. Uh, and you're actually looking at a potential drop in uh, government spending of about 3.5% of GDP. That's much larger than anything that the United States has ever faced for like at least 50 years. I mean, you'd have to go back to probably to the Depression to see a uh, sudden change like that. Uh, and so like, you can be absolutely sure there's going to be a lame duck uh, session of Congress, and everybody will be, the chicken little will be out in force. Uh, with, however, the sky might actually be falling. There really is a problem there. Um, and uh, so uh, I want to just briefly analyze this. Uh, and uh, let me just sort of stress, I, I got to begin by just junking the standard explanations for this. Don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I suppose I should say, I, mean, I, I don't want to re say, refer you to an article, but it's about, this stuff's pretty easy to find. I have a long paper on Congress on the internet if you type in my name and INET, I-N-E-T, you'll find that. That's, uh, and then there's short versions in like the Financial Times and uh, any number of uh, websites, I think Alternet, uh, put it up. Washington Spectator has the version I like, which is not to be confused with the American Spectator, by the way. Uh, anyway, the, uh, so the, the, the standard explanation for this stuff for ages has been redistricting. Now, let me just... I don't want to take more than about 10 or 15 minutes. I just, it's, that's just nuts. You can't do get redistricting. You can't get this stuff out of redistricting. Um, and everybody that looks at it, with a few exceptions, and that includes million, and the exceptions include millions of reporters for the Wall Street Journal and the most commonly quoted experts on Congress in the American media, but virtually everybody else uh, thinks that uh, is just a crazy explanation. The problem being this is that there's no question that some states, Texas is a real famous case, that's why Tom DeLay is you know, on Dancing with the Stars and not majority leader of the uh, uh, U.S. House. Um, for sure, Texas and other states redistrict the Democrats out of, uh, out of seats, and probably a few states, some Democrats probably redistrict the Republicans out. But in an awful lot of cases, what happens is all the incumbents get together with both parties and they stabilize their seats. That's, that's for example, what happened in California. Uh, and the notion that uh, you've had a giant change in Congress because of, say, 30 years of redistricting just plain, is plainly false uh, when you go uh, and, and actually look at it. You can also rule out uh, any sort of view that relies on voters. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of this. And some of the stuff I wrote attracted a lot of comment. Uh, so, I mean, I can... Just the, the bottom line on this is if you, to any reasonable measure of, say, liberal conservative change, as, as weird as this may sound, um, will show you that it's, it's actually like a, the heartbeat of a patient that's almost dead uh, over 30 or 40 years. Um, even Kate, I mean, 
as odd, a lot of, I mean, the Atlantic Monthly published a piece uh, eh, on its website a couple months ago which had a time graph of uh, conservatives versus liberals, and it looked like there was this slight dip since 1991. Well, if you go back to the 70s, there's no dip at all. Uh, the, a, lot of, a lot of people pe uh, pick funny endpoints. Uh, the bottom line is that you get a little drift, 2 to 3 percent maybe, this bounce down after 2008 and for, uh, uh, against liberals in favor of that, that stuff, is, it's one or two points, it's nothing interesting. And it's just completely crazy to think that that's driving the whole uh, congressional system. Uh, and there's, uh, if you put uh, that stuff together and on the redistricting, you know, you can get one very simple take that shows you that all the sort of simple political mechanism stuff can't work. And that's to reflect, never mind about redistricting, uh, and things like that. You look at, nobody has redistricted U.S. states. I mean, those folks elect senators. <coughs> and the Senate shows the same pattern of partisanship as the House, I mean, with, with minor uh, differences. In, in, in so you just rule that stuff out. Now, um, my answer to this question, okay, so why, why, what, what accounts for this uh, partisanship? Why don't, we can formulate very simply, why don't people cross party lines anymore? Uh, very much. And it's for sure not because they don't any longer talk to each other or play golf, because in fact people do play golf, uh, or uh, they even do benefits. There, You may remember a couple, only a few years ago, like, like four or five, I think <coughs> Hillary Clinton was doing a road show for a while with one Newt Gingrich. Um, this... You're, you're never going to get to this type of an explanation off that type of social interaction. My, my, my suggestion was money, but uh, not just the, the obvious fact, the obvious fact about money we all know, which is that there's like a tidal wave of it over the whole <coughs> political system. And uh, I would add it's a tidal wave that's uh, hugely actually underestimated. I, I'm in the process of redoing with a colleague of mine the whole of the Federal Election Commission data. And we just found, uh, when we did this, we found a half a billion dollars worth of funds that people had overlooked for the 2008 election. That's a lot of money. Uh, that type of error runs all through the, the published data. Uh, anyway, uh, and the other thing is, is incidentally, the uh, sort of your average contribution size is much larger than people uh, know. The reason you keep hearing all this stuff in the papers about small contributors Unfortunately, the database management systems that folks are using to get this out, even in places like the Center for Responsive Politics, are not up to the task. And so, say, for instance, most occasions, not all of them, if you give a political contribution out of your office with that as your address, and you live in Chicago, and later you give some money out of your uh, home address up at Lake Shore, something like that, most of the time the databases don't realize that that's the same person giving. And uh, it, it's, it's a colossal correction when you make it. Anyway, um, so it's really a lot of money, but that's not what my pitch is about on Congress. Instead, my pitch is some, runs something like this. You can tell the tale either historically or sort of systematically. I think it's most easily grasped historically um, in a sort of short presentation. In the 70s, the seniority system in Congress collapsed. Now, as so often, this was actually pioneered by the Democrats, and it was supposed to be a reform. Uh, though there, I mean, at the time it was said this would, for instance, diminish the, the cloud of the South, uh, for example, uh, in the House or the Senate. Uh, there's actually a lot of evidence now uh, by somebody else, it's not mine, uh, that in fact people were, in, were changing that system because they wanted more money, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, and that um, they were thinking labor unions can't supply enough money for Democrats. It is a fact that this system was about sort of the new system, which was pay for play at the individual congressperson level, was pioneered by California Democrats, and they actually did call it the California system. And if you look at uh, California used to run by far the most expensive state races. Uh, in the United States. In some sense, that system, in other words, came out of California, went into the U.S. Congress, and got, in the early 70s, 
uh, sort of mixed and matched there. Uh, and so the Democrats, in stages, abolished the seniority system, and the Republicans went along with it. Now, uh, those of you who sort of ever gone through a Congress course or ever got stuck uh, in Washington, D.C. and wondered, what, you know, so how do you pick committees, chairs? Uh, I mean, understanding that, you know, the, the system, the, the Congress is basically divided by political parties. I mean, first of all, the balance of power between Democrats and Republicans matter. But inside that, who becomes, uh, say, the chair of financial services? Well, what quickly evolved, I mean, this just as they're doing this in the late 70s, um, your material on corporate compensation is there, that graph, which, that wrong graph, but it, you'll, the, um, that timeline which shows you exploding corporate compensation, which also graphs out, in, as you probably all know now, into vast increases in inequality at the macro level, that's happening too. And, and so what the individual Congress folks do, starting with the Congressional Democrats, is they begin handing money to their colleagues to, uh, as let's say, how would I put this? You know, I'm likely to just say the simple truth. They were trying to buy their committee seats. The, uh, it might be said to be donations to remind them that they were running. Uh, but everybody was doing this. And what you got was an individual congressperson pay for play system developing. The response to that was one, a lot more money, uh, and two, uh, the development of a thing called leadership packs, uh, which are not to be, I mean, you can, ordinary Congress folks do an electoral committee, which is where you put the cash for re election. Uh, but then they developed what you can think of as a second pocket. Uh, in which you could put money. That was the leadership pack. That was so you could distribute money to your colleagues. Uh, large chunks of it would also pay for pizzas, consultants, travel, and things like that. An unsympathetic being like myself would say, eh, it's a slush one. Um, at any rate, leadership packs went from about 25 or so in the early 80s to there are now just about 400. There are a lot of, in other words, everybody is adding uh, pockets into which you can put cash, and everybody is filling more uh, those pockets too. Uh, but where the show, that, that by itself just gets you a sort of Habesian jungle of all against all. It doesn't get you uh, people declining to cross party lines, and it doesn't get you to the sort of top-down political system you've got where the political leadership in the House and the Senate on each party side controls so much. So the question, what happens there? And the answer to that is basically, look at what happens first in the Republican Party, uh, which in the 80s, you perhaps remember there were all these insurgent Republicans. The, the leader, it's no secret, was Newt Gingrich. Um, you know, we also know after uh, a bunch of court suits uh, and um, various revelations, he was running a, a campaign fund that wasn't claimed to be a campaign fund called GOPAC for six or eight years, which big chunks of uh, what was then secret money. The, the, the idea was to overthrow the House leadership, which that the House Republican leadership, which had been in the minority pretty much for almost the whole half century, with one or two exceptions there. And you got to a pretty interesting situation in the early 90s where Gingrich, who's not the Republican leader, actually ha is pulling in more money uh, in his political various committees, pardon me, uh, election committees, than the Republican leader, Robert Mitchells, uh, for example. Anyway, in, in 1994, the Republicans take over uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the House for the first time in ages. And, <clears throat> I mean, the three folks who do that uh, besides Gingrich, who was running the House side of it, uh, Phil Graham of Texas was doing the Senate side of it, and Haley Barber, uh, who's now sitting in uh, the, the, the famous Rove uh, Super PAC, uh, what was then head of the, uh, the Republican National Committee, was the, the sort of third person in, in that particular uh, trinity. Anyway, when, when Gingrich gets in, he and then, you know, Gingrich disappeared fairly fast, uh, actually, but Tom DeLay, T DeLay became the majority leader. He never became the Speaker of the House, but he was the, the, the actual leader of the Republicans. They moved to a pay-to-play system, not only in the sense that, uh, as Lou DeBose, an old friend of mine who wrote a really excellent book on uh, DeLay, 
a test, uh, they would actually sit there when they're making up committee assignments with a computer printout of how much everybody had contributed to the party, not just to their colleagues. Um, and that's the sort of trick here that really changes everything. The Republican leadership began to insist that it was fine if you wanted to contribute to your colleagues to encourage them to vote for you, but if you wanted the committee position, you would have to contribute to the Congressional Campaign Committee. In the Senate, you'd do the Senatorial Campaign Committee. Now, depending on, the, and depending on who controlled the National Committee, because a Republican, if a Republican president is in, he's going, he or she is going to control that National Committee. Uh, so uh, probably not pushing that as much. But the, the National Congressional Campaign Committees uh, become uh, the object of much solicitation. And they explode. And they real, a lot of money takes off um, with everybody contributing more and more to this. Now, the, the Republicans being Republicans, the way they actually organize this is actually a series of eh, free market deals <laughs> between the, um, the leadership and individual members that aren't public. The Democrats being the Democrats, they copied this system uh, in the mid-90s and after, and they formalize it. They actually start putting out published price lists uh, so that uh, by 2008, for example, um, let me just read you, uh, here's off one that's actually, the uh, rank and file members have to contribute 125,000 in dues, that's just a name for contribution, and raise an additional 75,000 for the party. Subcommittee chairpersons must contribute 150,000 in dues and raise an additional 100,000. Members who sit on the most powerful committees must contribute 200,000 and raise an additional 250,000. Then we go to power committees, in the, which, which are the more important committees in the House and the Senate. Uh, the, uh, actually, this refers only to the House. Um, half a million and raise an additional one million. Uh, and the, the, the leadership has to raise uh, 800,000, I'm sorry, contribute 800,000 and raise 2.5. The extended leadership is 450,000 and raise 500,000 uh, and so on uh, up to the House Speaker, uh, Nancy Pelosi. She had to commit to raising, to contribute 800,000 and raise 25 million. Uh, I mean, effectively, Pelosi ran a sort of big money duel for about five years with Steny Hoyer. It was a pretty amazing routine and it's probably not completely over. Um, you may see, it's the, you know, if the Democrats stay out of the leadership of the House for a, another session or two, you might might come back. But, but the, the point here is, this is really a lot of money, and suddenly the national, the, un, unlike previous ventures in the 20th century, um, it's, it makes the national party committees for the Congress very important. Now, it's, it's still true that individual members who who are incumbents and have been around a while usually take less money from those committees. They could conceivably raise more. This stuff really shows in new members and so-called open seats uh, there. But it is also true that the in-kind contributions that everybody gets, and I mean everybody, have become very large. And you say, what can you be talking about in-kind? Okay, here's one. As crazy as this sounds, uh, you can't actually legally call anybody up and ask them for money from your congressional office. I mean, that's, you know, I know it's nuts, but that's the law. So you have to go somewhere to do that. Guess where they go? They go to those uh, offices over there where in the, uh, the party uh, committee, where the congressional committees are for each party. They also use the television studios, and there these days, I mean, there's this endless discussion in political science, mostly beside the point, on the party as a network, which what they really mean is you've got a cloud of consultants who have to be paid. There are also electoral consultants. A lot of stuff you do in elections. Often, that's not the real service you're paying for. Uh, we will not go into that. The point is simply, it's now uh, a lot of money to uh, do uh, even simple congressional campaigns, and while you can probably do without 
If you had to, you could, as an incumbent, uh, you know, a 15-term incumbent could probably raise money uh, to survive a serious challenge uh, once or twice. It would be hard, uh, but you probably can't do without all the in-kind services and the stuff that's networked into you from other consults. Um, and, and as I've been sorting through uh, sort of national political contribution patterns, it's very clear to me that the sort of overhead structure here is the real, really interesting story. Um, in other words, you're erecting this big structure that individual campaigns need to tap into. You can't do it all on your own. This is, of course, if you thought this is probably not unrelated to the costs of media campaigning and things like that, you're right, it is. Uh, but that's the cost structure. The end result of this, therefore, is that the national party leadership counts a lot more than it used to. And if you cross them, you run a real risk. Now, one consequence of this that's not obvious is you, know, you hear groups like the Progressive Caucus in the uh, Democratic Party, and you, know, you, will, you may notice that the de it doesn't matter what's going on, Social Security, um, the uh, Medicare reform, whatever, or you get all these senators on the uh, right capital R, political right, saying like we got a gang of six senators coming up with deficit plan, nothing similar comes out of the Progressive Caucus. I finally sort of got fed up and I asked some folks, and they're, okay, why do these people do nothing? And the answer was, well, they don't seem to be able to quite get together. What actually happens is this, is that it's understood that uh, you can, if you want to squawk against the official sort of the, the general drift to the right in the, in, the, in the Democratic Party and the strong drift to the right Republican, that's fine. But don't actually make trouble for President Obama. Um, and so we're sort of stuck here uh, where um, you can, there are some Republicans who can dissent because they can afford to. There is a small, it's, it's I mean, small relative to the party as a whole. There's a block of right-wing money, the Club for Growth, uh, Senator Deminsk, uh, Political Action Committee, uh, Americans for Prosperity, and so forth, that will bankroll party challengers to Republicans, always from the right. There's nothing like that on the left. And in general, the party leadership can just freeze you out. So what happens is you see more and more party line votes. Uh, and most of the major deals, you also see fewer and fewer individual pieces of legislation. Everything passes in these big omnibus bills. Uh, that you know, you'd have a hard time finding it. I mean, somebody, somebody pointed out to me just a couple days ago, you'd have a hard time finding 100 roll call votes that mattered uh, in the last Congress. It's all rolling through on omnibus stuff. Uh, and what that means is, is that your national party politics is getting done between huge moneyed interest groups, the congressional leadership, the president, you know, depending on which party, is he, he or she uh, is in, uh, and that's your problem. Uh, this is the problem with Congress, uh, where uh, effectively, it's, and it's, it's amplified by the media, uh, because what you do is you sort of select a line, you push it, and it's like all the line, all the time, and never deviate. Uh, and people can't can't afford to break away. So as we now, there are lots and lots of folks uh, wringing their hands. I mean, uh, I had a, the, the, the former chair of the committee for economic development. I may actually run a congressional reform group, which has got to be the oddest thing, uh, you know, since an ostrich tried to fly. Uh, but um, that's how bad the situation is. You're looking at a at a broken system, and yes, it was. I, I am actually the person who said. You know, if you want a happy ending, see a Disney movie. Uh, that was the line that the chancellor grabbed. I can just guess how. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's a problem. Uh, and, uh, you know, on this happy note, I, I can always, you know, just you can cheer up this, though, if you think it's bad now. Wait a while. It'll be worse. <laughs>